Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is George Coat. I'm the chair of our Northampton Planning Board, and I'd like to welcome you to our Planning Board public hearing today on Thursday, April 8th. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and uh, it's great if folks who are listen listening and observing um, can keep their videos off. That helps with our bandwidth for sure, and helps us also identify the applicants and their speakers. So we appreciate that. Um, so before we open our first um, site plan review, um, we would like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who is here to make a general comment, um, not regarding either of the applications in front of us, you'll get your chance for that, but any general comments by the public that you're welcome to bring to the podium. You can uh, rate, raise your hand using the reactions toolbar or you can just do it physically. Okay, well hearing none then, we'll move right into our first site plan review. The applicant is the city of Northampton Central Services, an application for reconstruction of the roundhouse parking lot. Old South Street, Northampton map ID 31D246. And uh, Mr. Pomerantz, you have a presentation for us or your colleagues? Uh, yes, George. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Fagnan from Tie and Bond initially. Thank you. Hey, good evening, Mr. Chair and Board and Carolyn. Um, I have the ability to share my screen. You do. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. I don't know how long we've been at this and still, you know, every once in a while, get lost. Actually, if you bear with me one second, I'm gonna put it on the other screen so I'm not looking the other way the whole time. You see the presentation? We do. All right, excellent. Well, we, we see your desktop at this point. Oh, you see this? Right. All right, I guess I'm looking that way. <laughs> there we go. So, um, uh, I'm Alex Fagden. I'm a project manager with Tie and Bond, uh, West Hampton, uh, sorry, uh, Westfield, Massachusetts. I'm here this evening on behalf of Mr. Pomerantz and the Department of Central Services. And we're here to discuss the uh, rehabilitation of the Roundhouse parking lot. I'm sure most of the board is aware if we were fortunate enough to be in the chambers this evening, this would be right to my left out the windows. Um, and I think I will get into it, but I think it's also safe to say that uh, the condition of this parking lot is, is uh, beyond repair at this point. Um, this is a street view image that's actually a few years old now. So, you know, these, these potholes are even better now. So the, the proponent is the Department of Central Services, the city of Northampton. Um, the project itself, is, the, the lot's kind of broken up into two or three parcels. And, you know, there, there's the Pulaski Park parcel that comes down the hill as well. Um, the, the parking lot basically is built up on top of the site of the former Northampton Gas Works manufactured gas plant. Um, Bay State Gas donated that property to the city in the 70s and, and the, you know, parking lot took hold pretty soon thereafter. Um, you know, this parking lot kind of serves as a cap over some of that contamination, which again, we'll get into uh, in a minute. Um, this project is going to increase the parking count out there, which is why we're before you this evening. It qualifies as a major project. Uh, the addition of 10 or more parking spaces is the trigger in this case. Uh, and the objectives are, are fairly straightforward. Uh, we're going to rehabilitate the existing lot, improve the condition. We're going to increase the parking spaces. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is actually when Pulaski Park Phase 2 came down the embankment and created that you know, wonderful entrance up and, and the ramp to get up there, there was a gravel area there that uh, the tenants of the Roundhouse commercial property would, would park in, and they actually have deeded uh, spaces. And when that area was, was overtaken by the Pulaski Park improvements, those, those spaces, I believe it's 22 by deed, had to get moved into the lot proper. And so effectively, the city of Northampton lost 22 parking spaces in a lot that we all know under normal conditions is, is highly utilized. Um, and then, you know, ancillary to that, I mean, we're rehabilitating the parking lot. So we're looking to improve the lighting. We're looking to improve the landscape. We're looking to uh, improve stormwater quality discharging from the site. So the existing conditions, um, 
approximately three acres of, of land. This is central business. Uh, the application does not contain waiver requests. There are no jurisdictional resource areas subject to other regulation like Wetlands Protection Act or you know any, any kind of environmental uh, environmentally sensitive areas. Um, you know this is the northern parcel, and, and I'll show these on the map in a second. But the northern parcel um, is actually included in the Northampton Downtown Historic District delineation. And a couple of the adjacent buildings are also designated structures. Um, in terms of the, the northern parcel, we're simply putting parking lot back. So we are not changing anything. And in terms of the structures, we're not, we're not gonna impact them with the project. Um, and then uh, a point I really wanna make that I, I led into a little bit, but being the former uh, MGP site, the manufactured gas plant site, you know, that was a fairly dirty process that really isn't used anymore and resulted in significant ground contamination. Um, there's actually an activity use limitation, which is a deed restriction on these parcels. And that deed restriction carries with it a bunch of uh, caveats about how far you can dig and what kind of activities you can undertake on this site. Um, so, you know, we had to take all that into consideration in development of this, of this proposal. Um, the northern parcels have a subsurface barrier present actually, which is a, a geo marker about three feet deep. And if you go past that barrier, then you have to, you know, you're into LSPs, you're into uh, release abatement measures, you're dealing with the mass contingency plan. So, you know, it's, a, it's an intent of the design to avoid that, especially given what we know about the contamination that's there. And I, I guess I'll just note that there is what they call a partial permanent solution in place with condi conditions across the full site. And that's kind of the most recent iteration of that evolution of the DEP process to deal with that contamination. So I do have the existing conditions plan here. I drew a red line over it. And what that red line is, is showing you the general location of that subsurface barrier. So the subsurface barrier is on the northern parcels here. The southern parcels where the historic rail bed uh, was, the contamination is a little bit different. It basically, you know, it, it comes from this upper parcel. And so it's a little bit deeper and they didn't, they didn't install a subsurface barrier, but the contamination is still present at depth. So what are we looking to do? Uh, we're looking to increase the parking count to offset the Pulaski Park losses. Um, we're looking to improve some operations. One way we're gonna do that is by, I'm sure if you've circulated around right by the roundhouse, you know, it's like eight feet wide right today and it's, it's two way traffic technically and that can get a little hairy sometimes. We're, we're gonna go one way around the top of the parking lot, one way back down the west end, which is the backside of the, the new South Street, South Street apartments. And that's kind of crucial for two reasons. I mean, you've got people coming and going from the back of that building all the time. And you've also got uh, bike access that we're gonna provide from the, the little spur of the, the bike path up to the ADA ramp for Pulaski Park. So we really wanted to try to make that traffic circulation one way back there to simplify things a little bit. Um, we're going to improve the lighting. So we're proposing to light the full parking lot. Right now you just have lights on, on the main drive aisle and along the roundhouse plaza. And those lights are the old four-sided lanterns, which are not dark sky compliant. Um, and so the, the parking lot itself can get kind of dark at night and you know that can be a security concern. So uh, with this project, we wanna bring uh, the same lighting style in that was used up at Pulaski Park to kind of carry that theme right down through. And those are all dark sky compliant lights that um, uh, in, we actually got into the discussion uh, fairly deeply with planning and with Chris Mason and, and with the lighting vendor, but we are, exceeding uh, the, the current lighting standards that the city has, and we're trending towards the um, newer dark sky compliance standards, but still meeting the current Northampton standards. Um, we're also gonna provide for electric vehicle chargers. So the project itself doesn't propose the chargers. Uh, Mr. Pomerantz has a grant to do one charger now, um, but we're basically putting the enabling infrastructure in for uh, several more of these chargers in the future, and I can point those out on the plan. Um, and then overall, we're looking to improve the tree cover and the landscaping. Um, we're gonna do some clearing. Uh, the city procured property down on the south side of the lot. And um, there has to be clearing in that area to uh, facilitate filling, to add parking spaces. Um, and there's, there are several significant trees in there by definition, by ordinance definition. So we have proposed the appropriate mitigation for those on a caliper basis. 
Um, but we've also just proposed a significant amount of tree planting within the lot to try to provide some shade in there, which it's, it's sorely lacking now. I mean, there's nothing in that lot except a couple scrubby trees at this point. Um, we're also going to bring in an element. Um, I kind of delineated that barrier. So on the northern parcel, we don't we don't really want to plant tree, <clears throat> excuse me, trees because the root structure is eventually going to impact that barrier. Uh, long term, you're not dealing with trees that are going to remain healthy. They're going to be kind of constrained by what's going on. So um, one thing we want to do up there is we don't want to just, you know, today it's just asphalt. It's a sea of pavement. We want to bring in pollinator plantings, which have been used on Crafts Avenue and, and some somewhat in the park to try to extend that ecological benefit there. And um, there's a, a partnership on the table between Central Services and um, local harmony and Western Mass Pollinator Networks, if if the uh, you know if the concept holds, so um, we think that's a nice element to bring into the parking lot. And then for stormwater management, um, we got the approval from DPW today. But uh, just so the board is aware, the proposal is to uh, bring uh, install two uh, stormwater treatment units on the existing drainage infrastructure. And those will remove uh, total suspended solids prior to discharge to the city main. So they will provide a significant water quality benefit. Um, with the you know repaving of the lot, the existing drainage inlets will will perform much better. I mean, today there's ponding in areas and things, but a lot of that's due to busted grades and poor pavement conditions. So you know, with the repaving, we can make the grading work to the inlets, and we can put the treatment units in to deal with um, the uh, water quality piece, uh, but we we're obviously trying to minimize subsurface work on this site, and we absolutely could not infiltrate on this site because of the, the contamination. So I, I have the, the site design up right now. Um, the lot largely will, um, you know, look, look like it does today with the kind of the north-south parking banks, except these are all properly curved islands now. Um, and they're, they're either tree or pollinator plantings. They have the lighting in them. Um, we have an appropriate number of ADA parking stalls based on the total, uh, total parking count out here. And they've been dispersed. Like today, I, I, all the ADA stalls are kind of along here with the roundhouse plaza and then over towards the bus terminal. We're, we're maintaining uh, the van accessible stall over there. But we wanted to distribute these stalls a little bit so that they could access the primary, um, you know, point for Pulaski Park so that they, they were of benefit to the roundhouse building itself. Um, so we did try to move those around a little bit. Um, this area right down here is the area that the city acquired additional land so that this parking bank is, is effectively in that wooded area right now. Um, we had the fire department out last week. And they brought the ladder truck into the existing lot and they pulled it up into this aisle and they extended the, uh, you know, the bucket out to the back of the apartments. And so we've worked with John and his guys to make sure that uh, we preserved, you know, emergency access. And um, these islands are actually going to be sloped granite because the, the big truck, if it needs to come in here, has to be able to mount those islands. And we've actually mat marked off a couple parking stalls for, for the same reason so the truck can swing in there. Um, Working with uh, Wayne Fiden, the planning director, uh, we needed to find a spot for dumpsters for this, this apartment building. Um, so we, we removed one of the end caps in this area and we've, we've got uh, the apartment's gonna be allotted this oversized parking space here to uh, handle dumpster, the dumpster situation as they need to. Um, and that, that was coordinated through Wayne's efforts with that owner. A couple other features, I guess I could point out, I mentioned the, the one-way circulation pattern on the north and on the west. Um, we're gonna introduce actually a curb cut ramp right over here. And uh, that's gonna allow people come off the bike path and go skirt right along the building and then have their own dedicated ramp to get up into this area. And whether they use the runnels or there's an additional ordinance change by the city to allow them to use that ramp is you know, beyond the scope of the project, but, but we'll have effectively gotten them to a safer spot as opposed to today when they just kind of kind of make their way there through this parking lot. Um, the proposed stalls are all eight and a half by 18, which, you know, eight and a half is narrow, but a lot of them are eight and a half now, but a lot of them are like 14 and 15 feet deep. So you're, you're getting back to your zoning ordinance. You're getting back towards standards with this, with this layout that we're proposing. I think I can move off this for now. And obviously we can come back with questions. 
or I guess I, one other I would point out. Okay, the EV charger stalls, initially there, there's two or three over here, and we're gonna run enabling conduit infrastructure uh, so that there could also be EV stalls up in the, the top of these banks in the future. So the conduit we're going now, because we don't wanna dig a trench in a new parking lot in two or three years, obviously. And um, you know, as grant money becomes available for that, uh, there's adequate room to place those in these, in these median islands. So that should give the city some good flexibility to uh, take advantage of that going forward. And let me just look at the landscape and planting plan here as well. So we are clearing a significant number of trees down in this area, um, including a few significant trees by definition. So uh, in order to address that, well, we really had two metrics to hit. We've got We've got to hit a total number of trees based on parking space count, and that's that's 13 based on the total spaces. We've also got to hit a total caliper replacement based on the significant tree losses. So um, we are actually preserving 15 trees because there are you know there's trees along here. We're able to preserve a tree in this area and a few over here, um, but we're we're going to add 29 additional trees beyond that throughout the lot. Uh, and we did, we actually met with Rich Parcelletti out on the site and he did offer some additional feedback uh, earlier today that we, we plan to, you know, incorporate in the, any final version of this. But, uh, you know, we consulted with Rich. We wanted to make sure that um, what we were proposing would work for the city from a maintenance perspective, from, you know, the species that the city wants in these types of applications. Um, and so the, the caliper that we needed to replace was 51 inches and we are providing 72.5 inches of new, new caliper. So we are you know, going above and beyond um, the, the thresholds. Again, that subsurface barrier runs about through here. And so you'll notice that um, we're really not planting many trees up above that barrier. And so these areas with this, this alternate hatching are where those pollinators would be proposed. And that's where, uh, Local Harmony and Western Mass pollinators would come in and, and uh, you know, actually lay out the act, you know, what plants going where. But we do provide a list of pollinator friendly spe species in here. And again, this is very similar to what you see on the side of Crafts Avenue, um, and and gives us something in our opinion a little bit better than just saying, hey, we're going to concrete it, or hey, we're going to pave it, or hey, we're going to just put loam and seed. Um, you know, we think it provides a, a nice finishing touch uh, in those areas. So I think with that, that's the overview of the project. I you know, expect the board has some questions and discussion and I'm, and I'm happy to entertain those at this point. And I can take the screen share down if anybody wants to just let me know. Thank you very much. That was um, pretty comprehensive. <clears throat> board members, um, I have a few questions, but I'm sure there are some others out there before we'll ask the applicant for a few clarifications before we turn it over to public comment. Anything that jumps out at folks? All right. I do appreciate that. I do appreciate the slide uh, specifically inviting us to have questions and discussion. I, I think that is a very nice professional touch. Should I put a bullseye on the slide? Is that, yeah. You know, that, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I have a question. There, there's always buses down that are parked at the bottom of that parking spot. Is that by design? By bottom, you mean down in this area here? Uh, no, like it's like over uh, where the, Right where the 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 cool entrance to Pulaski Park is, those those cool stairs. Oh, these two. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's an ongoing. Um, I didn't um, know if that was design or I mean. It no. Was, I'm like, they're always there. <laughs> no, <clears throat> those are those are currently present. Uh, that's not by design. I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. all that needs to be said. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I'll ask, I think often in a parking lot of this size with this kind of uh, possibility for pedestrian conflict with cars, we look for some pedestrian striping, especially towards the bus station or towards the Roundhouse Plaza or towards the entry to 
um, the stairs to Pulaski Park. Is there anything incorporated in here? So, I, well, we, you know, we did preserve or we'll replace the, the ADA ramp and the striping to go over towards the bus station. Um, and uh, we are introducing like a marking for the bike which it's shared use. I mean, it's pedestrian too, but, but this area along the back of the apartments up to Pulaski park, but you know, in the interior itself, we're not really proposing any additional striping. It's difficult. Um, you know, it's difficult to put a crosswalk in when you don't have a defined start and a finish. So parking lots are always a, ch a challenge. I mean, if you have, if you're laying out a nice new site and you've got the sandbox, then you, it's really nice to be able to put those, those walkways in and actually have, you know, okay, I'm departing here and I'm crossing right over to that ramp. Um, right. But given the constraints of this site, you know, in order to do that, you would have had to just cross out one of these parking banks and you would have ended up at a net loss with parking down there. So that was definitely a trade-off and, and a conversation we had. Um, you know, we well, don't have this to- is one of, This is one of my comments too, Alex. I'd really like to see you get rid of those end cap islands where the handicapped stalls are. And then- These ones here? To the curb cuts with a yep. crosswalk. So those, you know, at the middle too. So they have a walkway to get from their loading zone. Yep. Not in traffic across the street to the curb cuts. I mean, you could absolutely drop, you know, these end caps right here. And, and you know, whether you stripe a crosswalk over or simply that, as you're saying, then provides you to not have to go into the drive aisle to get, you know, back up to the ADA ramp. You know, I, I think that's I think that's a perfectly good idea if that's acceptable to board to drop drop the caps in those locations. I mean, I would prefer that you know these folks have a safer route to the sidewalk than you know a little extra skinny little end cap that isn't really yeah. enough to do anything with. Yep, that's my uh, preference. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's totally. I, I think it's a good idea, and and you would just you would simply mimic you know. The striping area so it's you still define the parking stall and the end of the parking row but but yeah there's maneuverable space that's outside of the travel way so i i, I do think that's a good idea I mean, if, if you do that don't you just by default you get two handicapped spots without an extra unloading zone then on every row oh if you did it sorry <clears throat> if well you if you don't have the curb row. cuts then you have i mean by default you have loading zone for handicapped spots yeah um I dimensionally, I'd have to look and see if you if you met the, the dimension, you'd definitely have a, a comfier parking stall. I'm not sure if it would meet totally the ADA. Um, but yeah, I understand your point. You well, can, you have to look at the grading of the lot too. It starts to get pretty steep up in that corner and it's steep think, over here and it kind of yeah. yeah, kind of shallows out. It's kind of graded this way. And, and we're, you know, yes, we're tweaking it, but we're not, you know, we're not redefining grades out here because of all the boundaries. I, I think we want to keep the ADA spaces closest to the curb cuts where they can actually access the sidewalk. And so yeah, you've got here, you've got here, the, you've got here. Yeah. If you remove the curb cuts, does it affect that electric uh, vehicle stuff down the road? I think those are, those are largely situated in this area. So if you take these out, I don't think that really has much of an effect on that. And actually, so interestingly enough, a lot of the um, a lot of the EV grants now come with a requirement that um, one of the stalls be ADA compliant, even though it's not marked. And so, actually, this stall over here is going to have the first EV charger on it because, by default, it's ADA compliant because it's next to the you know kind of the big crossing area. Um, but kind of to this discussion, if you if you were to almost create those supplemental hatchings now, it might actually help with the EV charger later because it gives you that space that you may need to satisfy a grant requirement uh, for accessibility with with those chargers. Does it have to meet the two percent grading requirements too? Well, yeah, so it would, and that's why again, yeah, you're concentrated here with your ADA stalls because you do start picking up, and and we don't want to try to be cutting in this corner because we'd run into issues with the building and things like that. Um, so yeah, you know, this one potentially, but I, I think it's probably too steep up in the corner here. Yeah, I think I'm the sorry, I'm, I missed, I, 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 I came in a little late. Is there any solar or any of that kind of stuff that we're adding to this? No. So the, actually this project started with a solar component. We wanted a canopy over the whole thing. Um, and yeah. unfortunately, uh, there's some fairly significant sewer and drain mains through here. And so after working with engineering 
on what kind of clear zones they needed in the event they ever needed to do maintenance on those. The thing turned into just, you know, a little, little solar here, a little solar here. And unfortunately okay. it, it wasn't going to be economically feasible at that point. So, um, so no, that, that element came out, but the benefit is that we can really introduce, you know, a, a true landscape plan where we actually have some trees out here and we can, we can try to mitigate for, you know, urban heat island effect and, and really try to carry some of that landscape down from the park and then into the naturalized area that will remain down over here. So, Alex, can you tell us what the, what the total number of chargers would be when, in the future state, you know, that you're providing conduit for now? So we are, yeah, I could count them quick. I should have had that number handy. David, you don't recall, do you? Uh, I don't have the total number, but we was, we we're looking at every unit would be a dual head. Right. So where the charging unit would be on the sort of mid aisle break point between each parking row, there would be a dual head that would face in opposite directions. So I think for some reason, Alex, I thought we'd had a discussion at some point about 10 to 12. I think what we're showing is 12. Right. When we everything have... was built out, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I think, yeah, I think we have 12 uh, hand or six hand holes shown, which would be, you know, pre-positioning for 12 future chargers. Um, th this one is not, this hand holes just because of the alignment of the conduit. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're setting it up for 12 where we wanted, we wanted the opportunity to, to have this as a true feature of the parking lot, but also respect the fact that, you know, we need the parking spaces also. And I'm sorry, I mean, why can't you have the conduit for, like, I mean, running conduit, you know, I think it's in a residential thing setting, I think it was really cheap. So why can't, why can't you just run it for future use for more, more of the space? I mean, you know, you, you could, you don't know what the future holds. Um, uh, we felt, you know, working with David, with Chris Mason, uh, we felt 12 was a good, a good starting point that it provided that opportunity for, again, it to be a significant feature in this parking lot in the future. But, uh, you know, the reality is this is a heavily utilized, utilized parking lot. And if you start converting, I don't know, more than that to EV chargers, you're, you're going to start kind of falling off the, the mission of providing the parking down here so people can get up into downtown. Um, but I get, yes, conduit is cheap, you know, and it's cheap when everything's roughed in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I mean. I guess I have this notion of the, the, the future is when we're all, you know, I go to park and play with my kid at Pulaski Park, and while I'm playing, my car's charging. Yep, and absolutely. I, mean, I, I would argue in the future, when everyone has electric cars, the city shouldn't be giving all the power away for free, and there'll be gas stations that give you electricity that you pay for, like normal, you know? Well, Okay. Well, I mean, seriously, <laughs> if the city just gives it away for free forever, we'll never have uh, anybody, do, you know, the private sector will never pick it up. <laughs> a similar conversation was had amongst, you know, Chris and David and, and, you know, there's a tipping point in the future somewhere, you know, none of us can kind of predict when that is, but there's a point where it goes from incentivizing this, you know, great new, newer technology to, okay, now this is the way people travel and, and yeah, it can't be a huge burden on, on muni assets at that point. So um, I, I guess I mean, the other I concern I, I the charging I have, stations give you the option to charge zero dollars a kilowatt or charge you know a break even amount per kilowatt or to make money like it it just or, or shell sure. can yeah. our shell can can you know they some company gets to rent our infrastructure and make money off of it and pay for all the problems. So the other, the other just general concern I have on this site is any excess soil we generate, even if we're above that barrier, is probably going to go get tested and, and, you know, disposed of at facilities and things. So, you know, we have lighting conduits going in. We're trying to do the, the charging conduits. We're doing some minor drainage modifications. So we are digging in the dirty dirt a little bit, and uh, we are trying to be practical about how much we do. And I, I completely understand you want to do the least amount of work possible because of the, these soils. Um, I am curious, just what do we have right now? Three catch basins servicing this lot and they're so, all kind of in the center there? Yeah, they run one, two, three, four, five. And there oh, okay. Is, yeah, there's another one here. 
that uh, drains to it. I, I think I was most concerned water. with the with these two in the middle that in these kind of kettle pots because you know those are those are the ones that are probably going to back up on us. Um, so you you shouldn't get just you know inlet uh, drainage uh, pitch to the to the basins and potential inlet capacity definitely considerations. But you're sitting on top of a, a 36 inch main that has excess capacity. Um, so as long as the water is getting into those inlets, it shouldn't be ponding in this parking lot. You, you definitely have the capacity to. So you're not worried about the tailwater condition, but I was just curious. You know, it seems like there was a 12 inch pipe servicing those those two catch basins anyway, right in the center there, which are. Yep, you got. Worried about the ones where water can pass by them if there's a problem, but I'm just worried about those two in the center. Yeah, you've got the uh, 12 inch. So we're gonna drop like a cut in manhole style uh, for the treatment unit on this part of the line. You'll have 12 in, and then that goes right to the 24 inch RCP in this location. This 12 inch, which is kind of in the middle actually has its own clean shot to that, that drain manhole. Um, so th this is kind of one of the ones that's in a belly. Um, and that one fortunately doesn't have any, any connectivity through it. So that's going right into the main. Um, but no treatment on that one. Right, right. Uh, actually, I take it back. Look at this. Sorry. We are actually redirecting that to oh, okay. a, a cut-in treatment unit here that is uh, sitting on, on this line that connects, you know, one more short segment and it's into the 24. And okay. These plans look different than the ones I looked at. So we, we did, uh, I'm not, I, I'd have to defer to Carolyn on what the board has, but the, we did have a revision very recently. So. Okay. No, this is a better... This is a better layout than what I saw. So thank you for those notifications. That looks could, good. Could you talk to us a little bit about uh, snow removal on the... Uh, so uh, we talked with Brian, the, the parking maintenance director. Um, you know, snow removal today is largely a, you know, plow down kind of effort. Um, I could see, uh, you know, we feel in the minor events that the city has the capacity to, to st store that snow just beyond the bike path on the city owned property. Um, when we get into those back to back, you know, nor'easters, th this is going to have to get trucked off the site. So there'll be temporary storage in these, in the, you know, these lower spots and gone as soon as DPW can get to it. Okay, I, yeah, I'm a little concerned about that because the bike path is used pretty much 12 months a year, and there's a couple other places in the public lots where they use the bike path for storage. So we'll stay at uh, we'll stay on top of DPW to make sure that those temporary storages don't last too long. And and you know, uh, not an ideal condition, and and you know, I think we all we all admit that. Um, yeah. And that dumpster destined, which is now kind of unfenced is there a plan to fence that dumpster no the, the the agreement that is in the works includes uh i believe two dumpsters stacked in this stall um the stall's 14 feet wide and uh they'll have to come in before normal hours when the parking lot's empty and they'll have to maneuver a little bit and pick those dumpsters up but it's not currently fenced and and i don't i don't know how many of the details maybe david i not to put you on the spot, you know, I know Wayne's been discussing this with the new South Street and I just don't want to overstep. Well, it's, it's a work in progress right now because we did look at other options to help the complex continue to uh, collect and get rid of their trash, but nothing worked out successfully. So uh, we're willing to have an agreement with them to locate the dumpsters where they are, but there'll have to be some stipulations about hours of pickup and monitoring um, how the trucks are coming in and out and avoiding any damage to the new lot. So that'll all be built into the agreement. Okay, so <clears throat> part of our zoning does talk about screening dumpsters for sewer in these kind of arrangements. So if you could keep that in mind as you work through those negotiations, that would be great. Um, it's a nice. Is there right room now. to? Is it? Is there room to put it up? Sort of uh, um, at the top. Um, at the, uh, I'm not sure. My uh, up at the, yeah, up at the top over here. So right, over 
uh, I guess uh, on the left side over where where those buses are parked. Oh, uh, these. Well, those are supposed to be parking and, stalls. And, well, I get that, but I guess I'm just saying, like, I just think of it as the if the trash was over there, it's a straight shot, and I and I don't see like the trash companies doing any damage. Well, they would have a difficult time getting up there. You know, they got to circulate around, okay. and and if they're in these spots, you're not really, especially with this this configuration here, very difficult to get straight onto those. Um, um, I, I guess I, I was thinking about just backing backing in in the morning, early in the morning, and then. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think, uh, well, so we, we lost this spot when we, we put the ramp in. And then I think there is some aversion to, to putting those dumpsters here directly adjacent to the brand, you know, the, the newly renovated park, because you've got, you got the ramp going up and you'd have a dumpster right there. Um, so yeah. the, this spot is, is largely where it is today. Um, you know, we, there was discussion of um, allowing an agreement where they could use the, the area that the, the municipal building uses. But once you get too far away from a, you know, a source, um, A, it just doesn't get brought out. B, if it does, it's getting tracked across the parking lot. Um, and, and as David alluded to, we, we looked at options for up in this area, but the Pulaski Park parcel is pretty tight around the building. And it is explicitly forbidden to you know, dispose of garbage on a park property. So um, there really wasn't much of a solution up here. Mm -hmm unfortunately so we're kind of it's kind of the rock and the hard place um and so we we largely kept it where it was it's, it's a little further from the building and uh, tried to get it in a spot where the truck would be able to get to it with some of these um revisions that you've made uh both for the fire trucks and and for the um dumpsters now are you still at 21 new spaces or is that number changed it's a good question. Uh, so, you know, I read that earlier and I said, I better prepare because somebody's going to ask me that question. Um, no, I think you're right. I, the, these two would have been in the 21. So these two are no more. Um, and this spot is, is likely going to be agreed to as the dumpster. So you're, you're probably looking at 18 over existing capacity. But um, again, I'd note that's 18 actual parking stalls as opposed to today where you've got you know 14 foot bays in some cases and, and crazy drive aisles so um no good question i apologize i should have should have had that on the ready that's okay i i saw some 37s in the application as well but I that was that was um 37 was uh we used to we had a different layout that came all the way over and utilized some of the housing authority property, but unfortunately mm -hmm. that was a non-starter. So, uh, you know, gotcha. it's very easy when you're doing parking lots to be able to extend the bay and pick up a bunch of additional spots. And unfortunately we had to really squeeze it down onto just those portions the city was able to acquire. I have one more question while we're talking about that kind of dumpster location. Uh, yep. Looking at the photometric plan, it just looks like there's there really aren't any, uh, the light levels really fall off. Yep. Let me look here. Right there. So I'm just wondering if that's like going to feel safe um, in that corner. Yep. So you do. You get down in your your point one, your point two is very kind of outside of the cone of the lighting. Um, the challenge that uh, we had Apex Lighting working on this. Uh, actually, Dan's the one that I think did the lighting up for the park too. So he's very familiar with the area um, and the city. Um, the, the issue when you start to comply with some of the, the newer uh, cutting edge dark sky compliance, and, and I'm no expert, so this is, this is what I've been told. Um, th there's different metrics, and, and if we started bumping these lights up, we were really going to start infringing on the back of this building. And given that this is a residential use adjacent to a you know a central business property, we needed to be very careful with what kind of a light throw we got. So, um, you know, it, it became difficult to get the additional lighting, but um, is there is there an overhead highway light somewhere over here today? I don't I don't think there is. Is there? Because what this is definitely this is a photometric of the existing or sorry of the proposed. So you're not seeing any balance of existing lighting. So you know any light coming off the building, but but and the new South Street up top would factor a little bit. It's not going to bump this incredibly high, but. Um, 
I just wonder if you're having discussions at the dumpster, that might be uh, something else you can think about in your negotiations. Are they going to want to be able to see? Are they going to want to be able to see what they're doing? If yeah. They throw something away after dusk. Um, yep. And, and like B, you know, SL1, SL2 right here, um, frankly, could just be bumped up if the, if the property owner wanted it or was amenable to it. And, you know, that's a very minor field change, basically, when they're doing the final calibration of, of the fixtures. So, um, you know, that is something that, I mean, you could effectively condition and ask Wayne to look into in his negotiation. And I, I think that's a, you know, if they want it, which it seems like they may, then, then yeah, you could allow it to be bumped up. And I don't think that would be a very, very big lift for the lighting itself. Um, just to respond, I think that, um, you know, this does meet the requirements for going down to zero at property lines. It is a residential use. Um, you know, uh, oh, I, I don't think it's the obligation of the city to light every corner of this parking lot. Um, there will be ambient light as well. In fact, there is a street light up on South Street on the bridge right there. So um, I think in addition to building lights on surrounding buildings. Um, so I, I would not necessarily uh, um, encourage the board to require the applicant or the city to look at increasing the light levels just to provide for that dumpster location. Um, you know, it, it's been, um, a negotiation that's gone back and forth about what you know demands from the from the um, property owner for what how they have to have their trash you know um, located on city property and trying to provide that benefit for them. So um, I think there may be enough lighting already you know with what's on the lot and at the street. Does the city require minimum lighting levels in, in parking fields? Not minimums, no. So you don't have to provide lighting in parking fields? You can provide zero? Yeah. Okay. And I would that's add that, would be, that, that that's, that's what is provided key. up here now. You know, there, there's nothing there now. So big improvement, I, I, in my opinion. Yeah. Did we get this lighting study? I, I, I couldn't have trouble finding this. It was in the pack. It wasn't as part of the plan set. It was actually in the text document in one of the appendices. Oh, in the application? Yes. And, and oh, okay. C. Yep. yep. I see. OK. Um, my, my worry about that is not really the dumpsters. I think the dumpster trucks can figure it out and they have headlights and stuff. Is But there is this moment when you I mean, I don't know, I'm just going off of what it's always been like on the bike path there, but that is a very confusing moment on the bike path. And you go under the underpass, there's very steep, I mean, this is not in your scope, I get that, but um, I don't know, I'm just thinking about people riding at dusk and, and the sort of shoulder hours. And um, I don't know, I, I'm having trouble telling from the plan how far the scope goes towards that underpass, but uh, and, and honestly, I don't know if there's any lighting under the underpass or not, but it is a little bit of a, I mean, I don't know, we're creating a little bit of maybe a security issue. I agree that near the residential building, it's a, we don't want to light more there, but there's a significant grade change and there's a bunch of trees and stuff. So I wonder if that could be. The only part well, of your I point think I, as... would, I would argue is that we're creating a security issue. I think if anything, we're improving, right. you know, those concerns, but, but you know, just to that part of your point. Oh yeah, no, I don't think we're making a security issue worse at all. No, I think it's it's a it's, a, it's just an opportunity since we're dealing with stuff here. Here, I think while we're talking about the bike lane, can we just kind of go also go through what that separation from the parking lot looks like and how we're keeping the cars separated from the from the bikes? Yes, but right before we do, is this spotlight still active. So this is the existing dumpster. Um, this is the bike path coming out. And you know, this is older. This is, this is much older. So perhaps this isn't there anymore. But um, there was at one time a light there. And then as Carolyn pointed out, there's there's lighting coming down from the top. But um, maybe that's what I was recalling when I made the comment. I, And um, to your point,
point about limits, the other reason I pulled this up, we're moving these boulders back about eight feet. So, you know, we're, we are right up into this area, uh, halfway across that existing grass island. But, um, bike path. So, Today, the bike path is effectively an extension of those parking stalls. And that's kind of a lawless area of the parking lot. Um, so we have a minimum two foot stripe buffer the whole way, including along the drive aisle. Um, you know, the, this area here, this is, a, this is loam and seed right now. Um, Rich Parcelletti is requesting an additional tree planting here. Um, and this is pavement, but could very easily also become, you know, a little uh, tree area. I believe Rich was asking about that as well. Um, so in these in these parking stalls, what you have is a two foot buffer, which is better than the zero you have today, and not as good as a full grade separation or something like that. Um, the reason we did this is, and not like curbing it off, is is um, there is a little bit of existing drainage along like this part, say that will continue to go down the embankment, which is what it does today. And as much as we don't, you know, we don't want to promote any, any uh, runoff leaving the site and talking through with Doug McDonald, you know, uh, we talked about trying to match what's there now, just to, just to preserve kind of groundwater flow conditions. Um, and so that, you know, that's another reason that, that we didn't do like a curb. We talked wheel stops with uh, Brian uh, central services and, you know, his concern is basically that those get busted and not put back the next year and, and things like that. They, you know, um, yes, they would at least upon installation accomplish, you know, what you're looking to do, which is um, provide that little bit of separation and keep the bumpers from overhanging. Um, but it was basically a maintenance concern, which is why those are not on the plan either. Um, so our proposal is to provide that stripe buffer. There are, there's those pay by plate signs are remaining actually. So there are like a couple signs in that buffer um, providing a visual, I guess, a vertical visual. Um, but uh, that, that, is, that is what we're proposing in this area. I, I think in the rest of the area, you know, as you're driving along it, uh, two feet is, is fine. You know, you're kind of going with, with traffic in that case. And then these corners again are, are, are a little bit more substantial. So I think this would be the area of concern if there was one. I thought the plan was to uh, use those, what are they, eight, nine, 10 spaces to plow across that and dump snow into that wooded area too. So if you use wheel stops, you'd be pulling them up. Right. You know, hopefully or, before the first snowstorm or they would become part of that plow berm that gets, you know, moved. Um, so that, that that's largely the maintenance concern. Can you Alex, use, just, could, just, could you just, use um, removable bollards that would be there for most of the year, except um, during the winter? Potentially. Um, I do get a little, I mean, the signs are there, but I get a little nervous with point obstructions now adjacent to the bike path, you know, sweeping through this way and having individual bollards that could catch a handlebar. Um, but I, I know we're splitting hairs here because we're talking about bumpers overhanging the same space. So, um, someone who's I've, I've whacked my bike into one of those bollards. It's it's pretty painful. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a huge attractive nuisance though if you're coming the other way in the bike path and there's nobody really parked or maybe one or two people parked in those spots. It's pretty tempting to just cut the corner and go straight across that. Yeah, even I mean even now I kind of do that. Yeah. Um, it's going to be even more now this sort of rather than winding around. Yeah, this does, this exaggerates that curve. Absolutely. Um, and I can definitely see, you know, frequent commuters and things, especially earlier in the morning when it's not traffic, you know, not a lot of traffic and you're kind of just cutting through like they do today. Um, uh, this is a little bit of a different topic, but it has to do with this area. So I'm just going to have to throw it in there. And, and um, a couple months ago, years ago, it's all blur. Um, we expanded the central business zoning to include like 50% or two thirds of these three lots that you're seeing here. Okay. Uh, which I think was a really smart zoning change that the planning staff, I think, put together. Um, 
And something we talked about at that point was that this is an opportunity to do some, some it's one of the rare sites downtown to do density uh, and not have to take any buildings down. Uh, and you could possibly, you know, you have a huge parking lot next door. So there's some theoretical thing where you could, you know, some residential building or whatever building could could make use of this parking lot in a shared way or something. And uh, I don't know if that's something the planning, I mean, this is maybe more of a question for Carolyn and, and uh, Mr. Pomerantz. Uh, if there's anything we're doing now that would make any future development in that new zoning area harder or there's any thought about that? There was coordination with, uh, and, and I think Carolyn will have to jump in maybe and give a little more history, but there was coordination. I believe it's this parcel, the larger one. And there was a discussion of a future allotment of two or three of these parking spaces for a rear access, uh, particularly for emergency vehicles. And there was some truck turning done to validate that concept. So there has been some discussion and interaction. And, and the feeling is that we are not prohibiting that. We would just have to acknowledge that a few spaces would have to be given up to, to enable that in the future. And, and it's allowed for the fire department access to go over the bike path, I guess. I mean, that's all fine. Yeah. I mean, you would, you know, you would, uh, if you had a driveway through there, you, you would change the treatment of the bike path in that immediate, you know, area. It would, it would have to be kind of like going up through any other driveway, um, you know, whether it was the green markings like you see on the roads now or, or something right. else, you know, um, you would definitely have to give some attention to that though. Right. But that would be on the, on the developer. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Did I get it, Carolyn? Yes. All right. <laughs> it's still an option. And yes, then at that time, we look at the design and then the applicant of that uh, for the redevelopment of that parcel would have to address the design changes and the crossing. And same with the snow removal. It doesn't like to throw a wrench in the snow removal plans for the parking lot to do that in the future. The city would just have no. to get um, put on their creativity hat again and figure <laughs> out what to do with snow downtown. Along that same vein, um, some folks had often had a dream about daylighting the Old Mill River as it comes through there because it's piped through right across the, that lot, I think, right until it empties out on the other side of uh, New South Street. Um, but that, that dream would be lost here too as we kind of finish up this parking lot, correct? The Mill River went, went through here historically, but the, the core diverted it. I believe I, you know, I think the infrastructure here is just drainage. I don't, I don't think there's any legacy and I could be wrong about that, but I, I this, this is that depressed area where, where effectively it was and, and the railroad right. tracks ran through the underpass and the, the river was directly adjacent. Um, but I don't believe there's any, any continuation of that hydrology today. Right. There's something in the flood control plan. If it gets to a certain point, some water spillways into here or something, but it's, it's like some really strange circumstance. Okay. Yeah, it is just, it is localized drainage. Um, and there are also issues relative to the, um, you know, there's also downstream contamination. So um, it's, um, yeah, I don't think that will ever happen. <laughs> okay. All right, well, well, planning board, these have been some great questions. Thanks for bringing all those up. And David, rem remembering our last conversations about those zoning changes too that uh, were kind of exciting back a year ago or so. Um, but we, there probably is still a few more questions, but why don't we just give the public a chance to chime in at this point, if there's anybody out there. Um, so we'll pause for a minute and ask to see if there's any public who would like to comment either, either in favor or in opposition to the applications here. Please come to the virtual podium and give us your name and address. Okay, Mr. Pomerantz, this is one of those easy hearings. You don't have <laughs> anybody complaining about more parking downtown. Good. All right, uh, back to the planning board. You know, I have one quick question you described pretty well about bringing in the ladder truck and working on the, uh, the apartment on the west side. Did the ladder truck also go to the north side to the roundhouse and make sure that they could, the existing roundhouse and make sure that they could operate there okay? 
Yeah, I believe I know he he pulled into here, and actually David was out there, so he could he could fill in too. But I, the idea is is that the truck would come in and pull straight in, um, and and their their theory is you know we obviously got to get in as quick as we can. You know we will back out carefully the way we came in when things are resolved. You know they're not going to obviously try to turn in this parking lot. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean similar to the you know they they could they would sweep in here. This is a little bit wider than than this one is, so. They would sweep in here and pull straight in and have access to the side of the building. Yeah, the fire department, just to build on what Alex said, they they came down, they raised the bucket, and um, the, the apartment building represents a significant life safety potential problem. And uh, the chief said that uh, as far as the Muni building and Roundhouse, they'd come straight in, like Alex said, but being able to swing right in to get to the back of the apartment building. Uh, was a tremendous improvement from what they would have to deal with today before the lot is redone. Uh, so it, it vastly improves their situation for uh, getting to that building quickly. Right. And just to follow up on Chris's earlier comment about the separation of the bike lane from traffic over below the apartment building as the bike traffic right heads north, how, would, how do we separate the bike lane there that's just going to be painted sharrows and that's a that's a mixed zone and i think the improvement there is that we're, we're attempting to limit this to one way one directional flow that would be you know coming towards that this area where you come off the bike path and um so it is still a mixed zone but this is to the back of the apartments 25 plus feet you know, so, and we're, we're doing one-way traffic through here. So uh, you have good separation from vehicles backing up and you should have good separation and sight line to vehicles that might be coming around the top here and swinging around. So um, not separated, but definitely uh, sight lines considered, you know, the flow of traffic, things like that. Great, great. And, and if I understand it correctly, that bike lane is going to connect to the zigzag path, the handicap ramp, bike ramp that comes yep. down we're through gonna, there. We're going to cut a ramp right here. Yep. And so, you know, again, you know, you've got the runnels going up the stairs, um, which would be the current legal way to do it. Um, but, you know, the ramp is right there as well, if that becomes right. an accepted practice. So, You're right. Okay. All right. Alex? And, yes. Just, just to... Uh, uh, follow up on what we were talking about earlier about striping. So the parking division has a, a very aggressive and ongoing maintenance program in all the parking lots, uh, not only for uh, striping car stalls, but for signage, uh, striping arrows, uh, hash, hashing. So there'd be a fair amount of it here. So uh, for any concerns uh, of which I don't have any down towards the bike path, where we were just talking about bollards versus striping versus uh, some sort of uh, curb stops, um, that would be maintained on an ongoing basis uh, annually. So, and, and to me, there's a familiarity factor that people get used to seeing it and it serves the purpose that it was put in for. So that would be maintained as would, if we take care of the end caps up on the Pulaski side for handicapped access, um, very visible for people getting out and walking over towards the uh, accessible area in the back of Pulaski. Great. Um, currently, there's only one small bike rack at the bottom of the stairs. Yeah, right, right here, right? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to put another one there. Um, I think we're seeing more and more bicycle traffic, people parking and then going up the stairs to Pulaski Park. Um, I know there's not, we maximize our space for cars, um, but if there was an opportunity to, to add some more uh, bike racks or hoops, I think it would be well worth our effort. Um, George, just to um, note, there are bike, um, stalls as I think as you mentioned at the top in the park and um, since this isn't really necessarily a destination for bikes um, uh, I think the bike racks uh, you know the parking lot itself and so the bike racks at the top of the park are 
um, certainly suited for people whose destination is the park or you know the park and then launching there on foot to the rest of downtown. Um, but typically, I mean, so I just throw that out there that it seems that people typically who are biking um, want to park closer to their destination. Um, so they may, uh, I mean, they might get used down here, but um, it might make sense to look at other locations. Okay, well taken. Any other questions from the board members? Um, I think the applicant has mentioned a couple of changes to this plan. So I would assume there's gonna be a resubmittal of the plan to staff that notes the changes to those um, handicapped spaces. Maybe that notes the new tree placements that the uh, arborist has spoken about. Um, the ones down by the dumpster, things of that nature. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah. engineering is required a submission 15 days prior to construction as well, which would, you know, again, I, planning department should have it on record, but, uh, but uh, engineering also will have the, the, those stamped final, absolute final plans. Right, and typically the board um, puts in a requirement prior to construction that revised plans incorporating um, the comments the planning board discussed, so like um, eliminating those end caps. Um, and making a pedestrian crossing there, as well as um, uh, some of the uh, additional details that engineering, the DPW submitted um, and has been forwarded on to the applicant about um, some of the detail sheets uh, related to um, drain manholes, um, tree um, protection, pre and, and pre-construction, um, root spading, um, adding um, trees, uh, eliminating areas of pollinator beds under the critical root zones. Um, and um, uh, so I think that should be uh, definitely wrapped up into revised plan yep. before construction. And Carolyn, just to be clear, those are kind of comments from the planning board and staff. There are really no conditions at this point that we're adding. Well, I would recommend that you do add conditions, particularly about the changes to the plan. So if you all want to see those end caps removed, that those become a condition of the plan changes that, um, it, you know, so that prior to construction, these revised plans be submitted showing the alterations um, there showing the additional trees on the east and west end of the parking. Uh, I don't know if there's resolution or any interest by the board to require some kind of um, physical barrier at that or the parking spaces or if you're fine with the striping. So certainly that's a point of debate if you think that makes sense. Um, and I would also recommend that the details um, that DPW asked for to be added to the plans also be included in those construction um, plans. So that relates to um, materials for um, the tree planting and protection, uh, drain manholes, stormwater system, the details for the electric handholes. Um, and um, there was actually another recommendation um, by uh, the tree warden about um, swapping out trees. I don't know that that necessarily has, to, I mean, the board doesn't have to approve every single tree species, but just as an, uh, an FYI, um, the tree warden suggested a couple of tree changes that were single stem trees as opposed to sort of broadly um, um, developing um, multi-stem or wider stem trees. I don't think you need to do that as a condition, but those are some of the other comments. Um, and I think, I mean, I guess that would be it in terms of the proposed condition. Thank you. Any yeah, other? For the record, Mr. Chair, there's no objection to these comments. So that, you know, we're, we're not gonna, not disputing any of them. 
So the, uh, there's uh, the hanging question of, do we have enough physical separation for those 12 spaces and the, and the rail trail? Um, any other questions that we feel haven't been resolved at this point? All right. Um, so yeah, regarding that separation, I, I think that is a little, a little tricky for sure. You know, as we were joking before the meeting, some most trucks are have gotten taller and kind of bulkier, but not longer. But there's always that car that's going to back into those spaces and, you know, come into the tra trail itself. They're going to have a large bike rack on the back or a big trailer hitch. Um, so I. Th I think we need, we really need something there. And I'm not sure what is most conducive to the other activities like plowing. I, I don't know, um, David, if you, if there are any other parking lots where there are sort of those um, removable curb stops. I mean, along the lines of, of bollards, but they're not vertical, but if you had sort of the um, curb stops that could be m removed for winter time and then right. replaced, I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, there's a couple of different options we can look at with parking. And, um, you know, if, if the board is concerned and, and we can certainly address that, um, what we just don't want to get, get into is ending up destroying these every year uh, or having vehicles destroy them every year. So we could look at that. I'll talk to Alex tomorrow and uh, come up with some options and uh, talk to parking about it. And would the board members feel okay if we said that was an administrative review with Carolyn uh, regarding that? kind of mitigation? I had one other, what would be the issue, would there be an issue if they had a, an actual curb there? You know, a, a bituminous curb or even, um, I mean, the plows could just plow up over the curb or if it's, or sloped granite on the edge there? A, a low rise curb profile would probably be okay. We, we just have to make sure we've got the pitch to make the drainage, you know, the little residual drainage not get stuck against that curb line. Um, you know, we, we do have, you would have drainage in this region that would have kind of a, a, a ways to travel. Um, that would be my concern with, with elevating that profile there. But to your point about maintenance, that wouldn't be, you know, that would probably be less problematic for the maintenance folks. Uh, um, you know, one of the things that you could do is have the applicant come back, um, you know, give a conditional approval with some kind of curb stop um, and that the final um, solution um, could be, you know, brought back to the board um, uh, before construction, so the board could sign off on it. Um, I don't know if there's a way also to add um, openings for drainage or. Um, you know, graded in a way that it's it's sloped so it goes to one end where the curb ends. I guess I'd I'd say I don't know I don't know David if I know the curb stops aren't ideal, but that's probably the the best way through because it doesn't have a drainage concern and it, it becomes approvable at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, I mean either that... that or you could make a cut into the curb, just not make it a continuous, but have one or two cuts. Yeah, if I. If I was going to do the berm, I'd probably end up with the bike path up to the elevation of the back of the, the berm, which is only a couple inches, but you know, you'd have to kind of depress the whole path to create that little drain swale. And then you'd really be creating kind of a point discharge, you know, going down the embankment, which, which we don't want to do. And we, we did not propose to Doug uh, when we went through stormwater. 
So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily want to go that route where we're channelizing flow. Um, but. Okay. No, we don't want to set up a sheeting situation for the winter, Alex, coming across that bike path. Right. Freezing. Yeah. Kind of getting a nice channel there. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that the, I know the maintenance side is, is fairly reluctant, but you know, it sounds like you could condition a, a type of wheel stop and that David can work to satisfy that condition with the, with the parking division. We could make it work. They appreciate that. Yeah. I can't think of any other place in town where there's the same um, kind of situation, even by stop and shop in Lickers 44, where the bike paths rarely used, but it still goes through that parking lot, but it doesn't come in conflict in the same way with parking spaces. So you, um, curbs, curb stops um, along there, and then you leave it up to um, uh, central services to figure out what kind of curb stop would be used. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right, we had a little discussion about the EV stations, but we came to the conclusion, I think that 12 was appropriate at this point. Future, most of them kind of kind of just stubbed up for the future. Um, the, all right, there's nothing else. We could have a motion to close the public hearing. And that means we wouldn't be able to ask any more questions to the applicant. Move we close the public hearing. A second. All right, Melissa, moved by Chris and seconded by Melissa. Any discussion? Okay, so with our Zoom protocols, we'll go through this visual roll call, oral roll call. I'll start with uh, David. Yes. And Chris. Yes. Marissa. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Krista. Yes. And Sam. Yes. Okay. And George says yes also, unanimous. All right, our public hearing is closed. Are there any other, any other discussion among the board members or should we move to a motion? You know, I just want to say, I think it's a great addition for the city. Um, unfortunately, we do need more parking, much as I would rather see some other use for land. You know, we do need more parking in these satellite light lots. And it's a great <clears throat> kind of access to Pulaski Park and Main Street from there. So, and just adding the lighting and the greenery is going to be really good too. So, all right. Is someone bold enough to make a notion that a motion that includes our uh, uh, conditions that Carolyn laid out earlier? <laughs> no one, no one got it all. Go <laughs> oh, me to run through them uh, again. Uh, can, I, can I? Go ahead, go ahead, George. Yeah, somebody make a motion to approve or deny the application with the following conditions that Carolyn will um, reemphasize for us. Something along those lines. I, I will do that. I will move that we approve with the conditions that uh, that Carolyn shall uh, reiterate for us. Great. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, moved by Marissa and seconded by Melissa. All right, and if, Carolyn, if you would read them, then we could ask for a discussion on the motion. Okay. So um, prior to construction, the applicant shall submit, revi submit revised plans with changes um, that include um, tree protection, tree care, root spading for the added trees as delineated by the tree warden, added trees on the east and west side of the parking, um, uh, stalls on the southern part of the lot. Um, uh, a plan should show installation of curb stops in this same area. Uh, 
and also include details for the drain manhole, bedding material for the stormwater system and electric handholds, um, and a revised layout showing the elimination of the end caps of the parking aisles where the ADA spaces are located to give clear pedestrian uh, access to the ramps at the bottom of Pulaski Park. Um, and uh, prior to construction, um, all tree protection shall be installed uh, for all the trees noted to be saved and protection of the critical root zone and trunk shall be installed. And that's it. Thank you, Carolyn. Any discussion on the motion, those conditions? All right, pretty exhaustive. Um, so we'll move to a vote then on the motion. Um, again, I'll start over there with you, David. Yes. Okay. Then Chris. Yes. Marissa. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And Krista. Yes. And Sam. Yes. All right. And the chair makes it unanimous. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, and good luck on your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time tonight. Thank the board for their efforts. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thanks, Carolyn, for keeping track of all those. Sure. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Well, at this time then, we will move on to our second site plan public hearing, which is a continuation from March 25th of a request for site plan for automobile service change to a fueling facility by Paul H. Damore et al. at 138 North King Street, Northampton map ID 18D one. And I think the applicant and his team are here. We are. So thank you again for letting us uh, come in front of you guys tonight. Um, for the record, my name is Ryan Skatorl. I'm a professional engineer with Alpha Gunnishing Company. Our address is 120 Hebron Avenue in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, with me today, I have Steve Ullman in the yellow. There you go. Steve waving his hand, uh, who's our traffic engineer, and Larry Webster, who's our petroleum expert in the wooded area. Apparently, he's got a background on tonight. Um, also with us tonight is Christopher, um, Chris, uh, and Tony from Big Y, um, who are here with us representing their firm. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight is share my screen and give you guys a brief update from the last time, just to give you kind of what changes we made per the comments that you guys had and then open it back up for any questions you guys may have at that point. So if you give me one second, let me make sure I get the right screen here. So hopefully everybody can see the rendering that's on the screen right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and don't worry, this time I actually brought my computer home from work today, so I should be able to manipulate the PDFs a little bit quicker. So hopefully it's a little more seamless. So like I said, since tonight's a continuation, I just wanted to go through some of the changes that we performed. Um, I'd like to just remind everybody that we're here tonight for the site plan approval um, and that the use is allowed by right in the highway business district, um, just to make sure that's put on the record. Um, after our meeting last time, we went back and adjusted the site to address some of your concerns. Our first uh, change was to relook at the tanker movement that we had talked about and examine whether or not we were able to close off that entrance way off of the main direct entrance off of North uh, King Street. Um, we were able to do that. So as you can kind of see in the area right in here, this is where that curb cut was when we came off the main entrance. We've since closed that off. We were talking about doing a mountable curb island, but since we reran the tanker, we were able to get the tanker to come in along the main drive, pull up alongside the tanks, unload, and then work its way around the backside of the supermarket store. So we've total, I apologize for that. We uh, alleviated that concern, which I know was uh, a couple commissioners concerns whether or not there'd be too many people trying to come into the site from that end and also the lighting as it came into that end. Um, 
The second item that we adjusted was the cross access between our site and the uh, mattress store to the north. Um, we have reached out, uh, Big Y has reached out to the adjacent property owner to check with them about the agreement, whether or not it's actually fully vetted or if they'd be open to keeping it open. Um, we have not heard back yet, but what we did do was propose a change to, instead of just having it completely eliminated, we opened it up towards the uh, northeast corner of the parking lot area, which would allow cross access, but also control that in a sense where it would allow for good traffic flow throughout the site. Um, we also worked on the striping for the main entrance, as we had talked about last time, where it, uh, some of the commissioners were worried about how people would make that left-hand movement into the site. Um, Steve Ullman is gonna go through that in a little bit because it's not fully shown on this plan. So at this point, um, Steve, I'd like to have you come on and I'll switch the screen to the striping plan for you. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, Steve Ullman. Um, as you can see, we've used, this is all striping we've added to the roadway. We've narrowed down the entrance to a 14 foot lane entrance. Uh, first, I want to start in the center and work out. Around the raised island and the brick pavers, proposing to put a WL center line. On the entrance side, it'll be two feet off the curb and the brick pavers. On the exit side, it has to taper down to be about a half a foot off the curb because you have it's a narrow roadway in there and you have two lanes with the width. Uh, against that would be the northern side. It would be a painted island with striped chevrons. Uh, approximately, it varies in width, but the center of that's about six feet wide and it flares out to be about 20 feet. From that curve around, we're putting in a new skip line or dashed line to direct traffic onto the main site. Again, it's a 14 foot wide lane. Removing that line now that's from now where it is now to the new position by about 20 feet. So we're narrowing down that area significantly. We're directing traffic onto the site, onto the main parking lot more efficiently and you know, we're lining people up better. That there are, I've added a painted island around the little brick painted island near the uh, I guess near the more closer to the corner of the building. Again, that's yellow striping, a WL center line, which is uh, two feet off the, the imprint. And I have a curb cut there to allow people to turn left um, on, into the gas station from there. This is much better defines what's going on. People can see uh, where they're supposed to be. Um, with the norm, with the now four inch wide paint. On the site, we've added stop bars to each of the exits uh, with a WL stripe line. The one by mattress factory is only 10 feet long because of the way it interacts with, with the pumps. The other two entrances and exits the, have 20 foot long WL stripe lines along with uh, stop signs for each exit for people to better define where they're supposed to be on the site and how they're supposed to travel the site. And I believe that's what I, I heard was concerns about how to direct traffic through here. And if you have any questions, I'll, on the dimensions of things, I'll be able to walk you through it. All right, so Steve, we'll, we'll come back at the end for questions, but um, the final item that I wanted to make sure that we talked about today was uh, looking at the proposed lighting for the project. So our previous submission, uh, we attempted to try to lower the light levels. Um, we were at 25 underneath the canopy at the last submission. Um, we heard your guys' concerns um, regarding the light levels underneath the canopy and wanting to try to limit those as best we could. So what we came back with was reducing them down to a average of a 12 foot candle underneath the canopy. There are one or two spots that are above that 12 foot candle limit, but overall from under, underneath the canopy standpoint, we're averaging a 12 and then it quickly tapers off back down to your compliancy with your regulations. Um, we 
have received comments from the DPW director today. Um, I went through them and attempted to speak with him uh, regarding them, but he was under a tight deadline this afternoon and wasn't able to speak with me. Um, I did go through them and uh, although he did have some additional comments regarding the stormwater and the sanitary sewer uh, pump station, I don't think there's anything that we can't accomplish and get through prior to construction. Um, I will say that we are performing some additional geotechnical investigation to understand the soils a little bit better and confirm the NRCS soils that we had documented in the stormwater report. And we're planning on adjusting the stormwater uh, design accordingly once we get those ge that geotechnical data back and find out a, more, a little bit more about the surf surface soils. So at this point, I'd like to open it back up for any questions um, you guys may have. The only thing is I don't have a fancy slide that says questions on it for you. So I apologize, but we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you or the public may have. So thank you very much. And I'll pull it back up to the uh, rendering for everybody because that usually gives a better picture for everybody of what's going on. Can I ask a question, George? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, thank you for closing off that, that little curb cut for the tanker. I think that defines the incoming traffic uh, so much better and makes it a much safer site. Um, I do have one question for Steve on the striping plan, actually, if you wanna go back to that, um, that one. So, I think we're, we're pretty well defined for the traffic coming to the front of the Big Y supermarket and leaving the Big Y supermarket and probably even taking that left into the gas station. But the turning movement that I'm really worried about is leaving the gas station and taking the left to get to North King Street to exit the site. And that I feel like that's still very undefined for that traffic, which you know, again, could be 140 trips or 70 trips, let's say exiting an hour. Um, so is there any way to better define that exit traffic that's leaving the gas station, turning left to go out the North King Street exit? Mm. Good question. I don't, I'm trying to think of what would make sense that people would follow and yet not be confusing for other movements. Because, you know, it's a balancing act. I don't want to confuse other people just to help them. Uh, can't really move the stop bar because of the way the loading dock is laid out. I suppose you could do something similar. I'm thinking out loud here, so <laughs> don't hold me to it. But I suppose you could take and extend the curb line of the right side with an arc that comes in and intersects and ends at what I have now shown as a broken white line as a curve to curve them, get them going in the right direction towards that that cut through of the, of the double yellows. I think that's probably the most logical thing to do. That would push them towards the left a little bit and it wouldn't interfere with any of the other movements. Yeah, from there, Ryan, and just kind of an arc. Yeah, it would be an arc over. Yeah, I can't do an arc. <laughs> That's why I apologize. Um, but yeah, I think what you're saying is maybe what we could do and something along the lines of this. Yeah. No, I take it all the way. Or oh, we could do that. That's even better. I think if we did this area right here and we delineated that with, say, a paver section that was a different texture than the asphalt, say, like a, you know, like a, stamp concrete or a you know permeable paver and then we could then put the stop bar somewhere around here steve if we wanted to or extend it down farther yeah. but direct them out this way and get them closer to the oncoming traffic that's coming this way so that they have less time to have to you know make that decision and make that movement out 
that may even be a better solution. Use uh, even if you use you know the the red brick is a stamped bituminous. Even if you put in a white stamp there instead of the red, which would stand out, then you could have them swing. And don't know if you'd want to move the stop bar out there. I'd have to think about that. Or leave the stop sign where it is and just use that as a directional showing them where to go, extend the island. But we could do either one. I'm just, I'm not sure I want the stop bar all the way out there, but uh, it's a possibility. Yeah, I think anything that gets them approaching that that dashed white line at a perpendicular angle is gonna yeah. be much. Yeah, and I think the, the way it's gonna operate is the stop bar, even if it's set back a little bit farther, that's gonna be this area right adjacent to it is going to be what like we call it going to creep out there to start to better. move out and slowly come out to the, the stopped white line and then make their movement when they have appropriate time frame so you think that uh allowing the access to the north to the mattress parking lot is going to take a lot of pressure off of that i think that'll be a much more uh appealing exit for people and that's the direction they're going to be facing if they've come in from the Grocery store, True. most likely. True. And will that exit be marked with a directional arrow so uh, both ways so people can also come in that way at the mattress factory in and out? Yes. Yep. All, all, three entering, all three access drives are two-way. Four 24 feet wide opening. So you have a 12-foot lane in or 12-foot lane out. Um, so while we're looking at this diagram, the first island closer to the big wide current parking lot, did I hear that that's just going to be a painted island? There's not going to be any. The, yeah, that's a painted island. Right now, that's a uh, red brick imprinted asphalt there now. No, I'm sorry. Not where the cursor is, but the one deeper down to the, yeah, yeah that one. That is, there is a red uh, imprint brick pattern island there now. Uh, it's labeled as a brick paver, but it's really, uh, looks like brick, but it's a uh, imprinted asphalt. And all what we're doing is we're striping around it. You need that extra area there so the trucks can go in and out of the loading dock. Uh -huh. But having the yellow paint there will do a lot to delineate what people are supposed to do. The red kind of blends into the, the asphalt. Is there a way to refresh that stamped asphalt? Do you just repaint it red again so it stands out? I don't, I, one, I don't think the red will ever stand out against the black asphalt. Uh, and it's a, imprinted it's a polymer imprint into the into the asphalt i'm not sure you can actually really do anything other than just replace it they, they have I, I have seen them try to do that in various municipalities and what ends up happening is that a, whatever epoxy paint they try to put on it in about a year or two strips right off uh, especially after plowing so it's not a it's not a long-term solution it's a quick fix usually um, what you yeah. end up having to do is kind of cut it out and put a new patch in with a different color that really blew. Typically where we see the red brick imprint is on crosswalks. And typically you have that for the center of the crosswalk, then you have the white bars on either side to have it pop out. Having it in the asphalt there, you can see it if you're looking for it, but it's not, it doesn't pop out at you like a WL line would or a white line. And in this case, it's in the center, so it'd be double yellow. Well, I, I do like the double yellow striping around it, but I, I think it is nice to have some sort of a contrast too um, in the roadway. So, you know, however we can make that happen, if that's painting it, you know, every couple of years when you're redoing your striping in the lot, or if it's um, cutting it out and putting in a different polymer, uh, you know, finish now that, and that might have more contrast with the asphalt, I think, 
I think it's important to have those, um, you know, different color fields in there along with the striping. So I'd like to see something like that as well. And maybe that would be the same material as the arc that you're doing up top with the loading dock. I, I don't know, but something like that. I think both of them together really help define that, that sea of asphalt. All right, we'll, we'll absolutely talk with uh, Big Y and kind of figure out a solution. I think there could be something that we could do, whether it be short term or talk with them if they're willing to put in the additional expense to redo those areas a little bit. But we'll come up with some option that works, knowing that you want some color delineation that kind of further emphasizes that area. We'll find a solution for it. Yeah, I think that was the original intent and it's just, you know, worn out over time. So it just needs to be maintained. <laughs> Other questions from the board? Thanks, Chris. Well, we might as well take a bite at that lighting plan then. So if you would just explain to us um, if you decrease the, uh, the high hot spots under the canopy and other places and if you did, why and or perhaps why not? That would be great. Yeah, so we're going to get into heavy particulars on the lighting plan. I'm going to call on uh, Larry to come up because Larry helped prepare the lighting plan. And he's one I like to call my dark sky expert. So, Larry. Yes, assuming you can all hear me, good evening. Um, I'm not exactly sure, George, what your question is. Uh, we had a, a, a plan previously that, that peaked at around 25 foot candles under the canopy. <clears throat> I actually reduced the fixture count and changed several of the fixtures to, uh, to different fixtures, different luminaires, uh, in order to, as much as possible, without putting a lot of additional fixtures in, to keep a uniform illumination level under the canopy with as much as I could focus the, the brighter areas immediately around the dispensers, uh, which is the critical area where people need, um, need to be able to see clearly what they're doing. Um, yes, they can see the dispensers, especially the displays because they're internally illuminated. There are a number of warning and caution signs on any dispenser that people should be able to easily read just as a, for example, uh, and after staring at the lighted display, of course, everything else is a little dark uh, unless you have a, an ambient level that is appropriate. Um, I did submit a, um, the materials that I draw this from. It is a joint effort between the um, Illumination Engineer Society and the Dark Sky Alliance, International Dark Sky Alliance. And it is basically a model ordinance for, um, that you can adapt and adjust um, for your own uh, community. Uh, and it goes into some of the things I talked about at the last meeting, like differing light levels for different applications and different areas. And by the way, um, the lighting plan we saw in the last application is very well put together. I was very impressed with it. It is almost exactly at the dark sky recommended levels for that application. And it's extremely uniform, very nicely done. Um, I, would, uh, I would have to give um, kudos to Apex for that design. I thought it was very good. Uh, so we have lowered this down. And as you can see, there are smaller numbers under the canopy now, the numbers in there. Uh, what I did was create a, um, a measuring plane it's just the underside of the canopy. It's limited to just that area. And I was able to extract the average illumination level under there from that, from that plane. And I, um, I believe it's right around 12 foot candles is the average. It's in the table down below. I can't see it from here. But we have, we have peaks obviously that are somewhat above that, but the average illumination, it's calculation surface three the average is 12.4 foot candles. 
and the actual max illumination level is 16.7. This is very close, maybe slightly higher under the canopy than the speedway on Main Street. I went and measured that this week. Um, so if you want to get a sense, uh, Chris, on what it looks like as you're driving by or what it will look like, uh, it's very similar to the speedway and at about half or a little bit less than what the uh, pride is up the street from the speedway. Um, I think it's a pretty, a pretty good stab at something that I feel works under the canopy. Um, also, I might point out that it is completely compliant with your cutoff requirement at the property line. Uh, we're below 0.5 foot candles all the way across the board there. Uh, additionally, there is some, uh, there is some influence. Uh, this one I forgot to mention, we did, I was able to model a close approximation of what the existing street lights are putting in there. So you can see approximately what the levels are coming in the drive now and on the island, the existing light on the island, just below where the tanks are. Those are obviously quite a bit higher than before. Uh, and I, I, again, I went out and measured what's there to compare it with um, the information that Big Y was able to get me concerning the fixtures that are there now. Um, it's actually in the entrance itself where you immediately come off the road. It's actually a little hotter than what I show there, uh, but uh, it's pretty, pretty close up in the island and in the area uh, on the lot that we're working on is very close to what I expect it will be once we're done. So I'm open to additional questions. Well, thank you for that explanation, Mr. Webster. And yes, thanks, thanks a lot for sending along that reference manual from the dark skies and the other ones. That was very helpful. And I know they give allowances for um, lighting that's under canopies because it certainly doesn't have that same spread um, upwards. But um, our, our zoning Regs still do speak to about a you know a, a high point of five foot candles, um, and I appreciate that you've gone down from 25 to 12, 11 underneath the canopy, um, and I can't speak to Speedway at this point. That was done quite a while ago. I'm not sure what kind of review that went through at that point, um, but looking at this new application, I think we want to make sure that we're um, Kind of sticking as close as we can to what our ordinance speak to. Um, Carolyn, do you want to add anything at all about your review of the lighting? Um, no, can you just, I know you focused on um, the average under the canopy. If you were to, what was, can you zoom in on the chart to show the board what the overall site average is? So the overall site average was uh, 2.31 okay. for candles. Okay. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, the city is certainly has um, weighed heavily used the model ordinance um, that um, Mr. Webster emailed along um, certainly in our latest draft of our lighting ordinance. So it's um, definitely something that we um, look to to help um, guide our ordinances. And yes, there are, um, I mean, one of the problems with our ordinance is that we aren't, um, uh, we don't have, we don't use line for line um, the same zone calculations that are identified in the um, model lighting ordinances in um, terms of the use. It doesn't match up exactly the way, um, and, and not that we would need to do that, but I'm just saying um, that there are variations that are recommended in terms of um, the location, um, business districts versus residential districts. Um, so I think that, and you absolutely have the ability to waive um, the standards in the zoning. I think that 
um, as you know, with the lighting at Cumberland Farms, you uh, the board required lower light levels. Um, I think there's a lot more ambient lighting in this area than um, probably even up in Florence Center. Um, so I would think that those levels, even under the canopy, instead of you know creating um, the amount of glowing effect that um, this might be perceived to be created here in this location could probably be dropped. But again, it's up for debate by the planning board. They certainly have the ability, you certainly have the ability to waive the standards. Um, and overall, obviously the averages are well below what the um, uh, lighting uh, maximums in for HB um, are in the zoning district, in the zoning ordinance. Thank you. All right, if there are no other comments from the planning board members, you know, we'll, we'll kind of rest on that, the averages then of the foot candles. Um, and I'll, you know, I, I guess then we condition, we, we provide that waiver to exceed the ordinances as for this um, location. Yeah, I, I just wanna go on record as saying, I don't have any concerns for the lighting levels at this location. Um, I don't know if, you know, I do worry about getting into a slippery slope situation, setting precedents and, and all that. Um, but for this project and this location, I, I, I have absolutely zero concerns about lighting levels. Yeah, I don't think we're doing anything that is going to give them some kind of huge retail advantage over other convenience you know, stations or you're not going to go to this gas station because it has better lighting and it's enough. I think if it got much lower, honestly, it would it would start to be hard for, um, you know, it gets dark pretty early here a lot of the year. You know, we have eight months of winter, remember? So, and uh, and I don't know, I think on a slippery slope is where you most need good lighting. So, but that's for another day. <laughs> Thank you, David. No bump. <laughs> Uh, I I would just uh, pipe in to say that hearing this presentation and seeing how it evolved without sort of, you know, really understanding sort of all the technical aspects of what all this means was very educational. Um, and it does seem to me that the sort of the average seems to be a more useful number uh, or, or more useful way of thinking about it. Um, so I, I found that found that helpful. I would also just, you know, the lawyer in me also have to, has to say that the slippery slope argument or not doing things in, in, you know, because of the slippery slope is often not the most persuasive uh, reason to not do something. It's, it's, uh, it, it kind of falls short of evaluating what comes before us on the merits as it comes to us. Um, and, you know, that's what we're here for. So, um, so I feel, I feel very comfortable that the applicant has taken into consideration our concerns about it, made adjustments as appropriate, and will be able to, you know, go through the same process the next time. And, and I will, I, for my part, I will do it a little better educated than I was before. So thank you. Right. Yeah, I, I think I see a little in service, perhaps uh, site visits for us with a light meter and someone experienced with that. So we can perhaps as a board, go and look at a couple of different applications and see what we mean um, by some of these levels that might be helpful. And certainly our eyes are all very different, youth and age and whatnot, but uh, I think it would be helpful because we do look at these lighting plans much more um, over the years as dark sky standards become so prevalent, much as we've really <laughs> discussed trees. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would if I could just uh, add one thing and which would may help you guys better perceive it is um, I think in our first presentation, we Larry broached upon the subject on what we call the doubling effect when it comes to photometric foot candles and how our eyes actually perceive it. So when we talk about lighting levels that are one more foot candle, two more foot candle, that isn't exactly a perception, something that your eye can actually perceive. So it goes by a doubling. So if you had a five foot candle, for you to actually see a visual change in that foot candle level would be up to a 10 and then subsequently a 20. So 
I, I'm starting to prepare a, a new graphic. I haven't yet fully mastered it yet, but I want to kind of, because this is coming up to be a little bit more frequent when we go in front of commissions now. And I think it is hard for everybody to kind of grasp the doubling effect. So I'm going to try to eventually put together a graphic that I'd be more than happy to share with you guys when it does happen, when I do finish it, but kind of showing how, you know, a small change in a foot candle level really isn't perceived by your eye. It actually has to be doubled in order for you to understand and actually see it and, un and actually be able to perceive it. So. Thank you. I'm glad we can be helpful in that process for you and us. Um, the other issue we had left over from um, last time was a little conversation about um, making the site as, um, ready for photovoltaic. And we had a discussion that the big Y is, has a increased capacity via solar farm that would make up for that. We talked yes. about perhaps yep. the, the corporation uh, of, of installing some electric, some EV hookups for electric vehicles out in their parking lot, if not on this site at all, um, and not at the, in the gas station um, footprint. So did you have any discussion back with your corporate offices on? Yes. Um, so the photovoltaic we had talked about last time, so big Y is part of a program with Nexamp. Um, they purchase large solar um, voltage from basically from a solar farm. Um, they actually share, uh, they get a third of their electricity for this property from that um, shared kind of solar field. Um, this gas station would also dip into that. Um, they use it for a plethora of sites throughout Massachusetts. So they buy a large storage of electricity from that next amp kind of solar farm. And then they use that to, you know, help um, electrify some of their stores. So I believe there's 19 that are being utilized in Massachusetts, this being one of them. And the gas station here would also share from that usage. Um, when it comes to the, e, uh, the EV charging stations, we had talked about, you know, potentially putting one in the supermarket. There is plans, there are plans to, uh, add another charging station. Um, I'm not sure of the exact timeline of it, but they are planning on doing a new high-speed one over at the supermarket area. Um, uh, I did get confirmation on that the last time I spoke with Chris Elliott and Tony Coppola over at Big Y. So um, there are plans for that. And like I said before, right now the station is serving a need that's an immediate need for its customers. But, you know, down the road, there's no, there's no, um, Kind of restriction that this could not potentially become some other type of station as technology advances and you know fossil fuels start to go a little bit down and you know electric stations start to come up a little bit more frequently so right now it's servicing the need that they have in re to reward their customers but they are opening up to different avenues as they go forward so thank you any questions from the board on that issue I'd just like to formalize the addition of the, the second EV charger as part of this application. Okay, thank you, Chris. So language such that Carolyn in her super way will develop for us such that in, within uh, 18 months, um, a certificate will be shown to the planning office that such and such has been installed. You can do it before the final closeout of this permit too. Okay, all right. Because it's not called a CO. What is a, it's not a certificate of occupancy, is it? Um, well, it's a final um, sign off of the permit, whatever that may be. Okay. All right, great. Um, the other item hanging out there from last time was around the traffic mitigation. Um, we, we provided kind of a waiver on a full traffic report because of the COVID and the lack of kind of traffic at that point. But I know you had some discussions with the planning office around um, uh, an installation or a preparation for the Valley Bike Station. 
in lieu of paying $48,000 into the um, traffic mitigation fund. So has there been any movement on that? Yeah, so I can speak to that, um, George, actually. Um, as it's sort of the same as heading into the previous hearing, um, we're working on language. Typically the traffic mitigation isn't required to be addressed until the final sign off of a permit or certificate of occupancy. Um, so they have, Big Y has definitely agreed to um, provide their mitigation in um, uh, hosting a bike share station, putting the pad in, um, providing electricity to the pad and signing a license for that. So it's just a matter of the details language. Um, but again, we would want to make sure that the license is signed before construction starts and then that the station is um, installed prior to the final sign off and, and opening of the gas station. Great. Okay, doke. Other questions from the board? We had a little discussion at our first meeting around the, uh, the kiosk, which is the wrong name for this, because um, they will be, I, I think the intention is to have folks come inside the building, grab coffee, cigarettes, scratch tickets, all of those nice, <laughs> nice things. Um, and we thought there might be some car conflict with traffic, but I don't think that went anywhere. Folks are okay with that um, alignment of the convenience store with the pumps and the cars and the pedestrians. It's a risk that you take to win millions of dollars. You know? <laughs> Thanks, Sam. You take your life in your head for a scratch ticket. Okay. <laughs> All right. And the one handicap space will stay there for uh, convenience parking for those folks. And the other folks will just park in front of the pumps and walk in. All right. Good. I think we're going through our list. Um, Carolyn, was there any outstanding comments from the DPW that they didn't? Yeah, there were still some that went along back to the applicant as, as they presented um, issues just needing to um, get confirmation of the, um, get a test pit of where they're put, proposing the leaching catch basin to make sure that it meets the stormwater standards for being above high groundwater. Um, there's still an issue about whether the sewage um, line will um, function. That's, that's definitely technical. They're going to have to work that out. If it doesn't, then they're going to have to, you know, figure that out. I don't know that it makes a difference on the surface. Um, if it does change the issue, the conditions on the surface, they require it to come back to the planning board. They can, um, that would be an amendment, but I don't see that as an um, issue um, the board would need to address in a condition. Um, there were, um, I think it would be important to um, also ensure that the stormwater maintenance be recorded. That was a recommendation from the DPW um, maintenance plan go on record. Um, and uh, the other item that's come up since then, of course, is this new striping. Um, I think it makes sense to make sure that they're on some kind of regular schedule of painting. Um, and repainting, uh, restriping the site um, so that those lines do stay vibrant and help to direct the traffic flow or in and around the site. But uh, those are um, uh, basically the um, issues. Some of them were resolved from the last DPW memo to this one, but um, I, I've given a recommendation to you all about how to wrap some of those into conditions. And again, the applicant has seen them. Great. Okay, dope. Well, why don't we pause for a minute and turn it over to the public now that we've kind of gone through our list here. Um, so at this point, we'll ask if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to come to the podium and speak in favor or against the application.
Just unmute yourself, raise your hand, wave. Okay, hearing none at this point, we'll go back to the board. Are there any other final questions or clarifications of the conditions that Carolyn laid out? I guess, Carolyn, for me, it would just be the, uh, the maintenance plan for any stormwater retention ponds plan just filed with the DPW or in the city, in, in the planning office. So how do we do a maintenance plan regarding the striping of that area? Does that, who kind of enforces that? The building inspector, the, how does that work? Well, um, first, just to clarify, the stormwater maintenance would go on records, the registry of deeds, register of deeds. Um, the striping is really just an ongoing condition. And ultimately, yes, the building commissioner is in charge of enforcing zoning um, requirements. But I think it becomes one of those issues where if anybody out and about says, hey, those lines are gone. <laughs> um, Chris. Uh, faded, <laughs> then that's a trigger to say, you know, knock on the building commissioner's door and say, hey, I think it's time for Big Y to, I mean, it's going to be part, if you adopt this as, I mean, if you vote to include that as a condition, the condition stands with the permit, just like any other condition. And yes, there is a, you know, um, there is a, a mechanism for enforcing that, but it also is, um, you know, it's not, it, it does take some oversight, but we would hope that the applicant stays on top of their, you know, requirements for keeping the site um, in compliance with the permit. So, so I was just told by Big Y that um, they restripe every spring. So. Okay they're not going to object to it if you know that becomes a condition to make sure the striping is fresh okay. so thank you all right if we don't have any other questions for the applicant we could think about closing the public hearing everybody feels comfortable with our information i'm going to close the public hearing <laughs> All right, Let's moved by David and seconded, I think, by Marissa. Okay, motion's been made to close the public hearing. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to our Zoom vote. Um, we'll start with Krista this time. Thumb. I'll take that as a sorry, Chris, George. I was I'm passing because I wasn't able to watch the Zoom meeting from last time. I had said that in the very beginning, okay. and I'm having some internet issues, which is why I've taken myself off video. I'm we're cutting in and out over here. I'm very video. good. So you're sorry. abstaining from these votes. You're passing yes, from the votes. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Marissa. Yes. Close the public hearing. Okay, Sam. Yes. All right, and Melissa. Yes. And Chris? Yes. And uh, David? Yep. All right, and then the chair votes yes also. Okay. So any discussion among board members on the application? If not, someone will be brave enough to make a, a motion. Uh, I uh, move that we uh, approve um, the site plan with uh, the conditions that I would ask uh, again, Carolyn, to to reiterate for us. Can we do that Carolyn. now or after the second? Yeah, is there a second? Thank you. The motion's been made and we're waiting for a second. Um, second. No, thank you, David. All right. <laughs> and now we'll hear from Carolyn. 
Okay, so what I have is uh, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall um, sign an easement or license agreement with the city for a bike share station pad location located on site. The agreement shall be approved by the city upon determining that it meets the standards for being publicly accessible for a 50 year term, or, or I should say, um, uh, I think we've narrowed that down to a 48-year term for various reasons. <laughs> um, if such agreement cannot be met, the applicant shall agree to make a payment of $48,000 to meet the mitigation requirement for increased trip generation to the site. Um, prior to, these are a little bit out of order, sorry. Um, prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall install a bike share station pad as it then find in the agreement. Um, that's ready for dock, rail, and kiosk, or alternatively make a payment um, for their traffic mitigation. Um, also prior to certificate of occupancy or final sign off, um, stamped as built lighting plan shall be submitted showing light levels no greater than shown on the plans. I didn't hear any um, 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 move to change that. Um, all pavement markings shown on the plan shall be striped as needed, but at intervals of no greater than every two years. Um, also, final uh, prior to final sign off, additional EV charging station shall be installed on the property. Um, and sorry, out of order prior to construction and 15 days prior to such site work. Um, modifications to plans um, showing um, uh, materials for erosion control, protection of the inlet gate just beyond work limit lines, consistent arrow striping between details in the site plan, um, compliance with sewer connection requirements shall be shown in the plans. Um, and prior to any site work, a stormwater operations and maintenance and inspection plan should be um, uh, recorded and first after approval by uh, the DPW and test pitch showing the leaching catch basins will meet stormwater standards as presumed must be uh, provided to the city. Um, there was one item but that's the list um, I did not include in that the issue that came up that I didn't hear any further discussion about um, as it relates to either recoloring or replacement of the brick paver or the polymer that's a um, contrasting color to the asphalt. I don't know if you feel that that should be included in the, in the conditions as well. I think there's there's two issues, right? There's, I, I think they're proposing to put in some new sort of, um, at the loading dock, they're proposing to do some sort of new treatment there. Mm -hmm. And then yep. there's yep. also, are we, you know, would we require them to also revamp the existing pavement treatment at the other two locations? Right. Um, okay, so I'll add the um, extension of that curb delineation essentially at the loading dock. Um, and uh, if you all feel that it's important to have that treatment either consistent with the existing um, brick paver asphalt treatment, then that should be part of the condition as opposed to saying the applicant said they could do that. I think that makes a lot of sense given all the new traffic patterns here. Um, and as people become used to coming in and out of this gas station that it's really pronounced for this time. Um, I can't imagine that it's, a, it's an egregious amount for the applicant to put forward. Okay, so then um, if that, if I could word add that into the, um, um, requirements as part of the construction plans that come in 15 days prior to construction. Good. And that's all I have. Great, great. Okay, any discussion on the conditions? 
Thank you very much, Carolyn, for keeping track of those. My chicken scratch would never be able to get them the same way. All right, so the, this, the motion's been made to approve the application with the conditions as noted. Um, and we'll go through a roll call. Why don't we start with David at this point? Yep. All right, and Chris? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Sam? Yes. And Marissa? Yes. Great, and Krista is abstaining, and uh, George votes yes also. I think that's it. Thank you very much, team, for your diligence and coming before us two times. Good Thank luck you with your project. Much. Thank you. Thank you. And planning board, I think we have a couple of administrative issues to deal with. So we need to hang on there for a little bit. I don't know if any of you are hockey fans, but UMass is in the frozen four tonight. <laughs> yes, yes. Second or third yes, period. Started. The game has started. Let's, let's okay. come on. <laughs> All right. What do you have for us, Carolyn? I have this A&R um, on Kennedy Road. Um, so if I'm going to scroll down here this is that you all approved a shared driveway permit a couple months back on this parcel. Um, and the A&R concerns this area at the front end. So this is a non-conforming flag lot. Um, and then the rest of this land here um, is a conforming lot. So the idea is, um, and actually this parcel is a former planning board members lot. Alan Burson has owned this parcel here. So um, this is a request for some land swap. So um, these little strips, they're the same dimension because it's a non-conforming flat lot. So the total frontage and width of that non-conforming flat lot would stay the same. It's just shifting over into this big parcel. So um, it's like a domino effect. Um, Alan Verson's parcel, parcel B, um, will um, um, obtain par uh, parcel one there. Then parcel two would be conveyed. Um, so it just sort of um, swap down into this bigger parcel. So it's just the same dimension of land that's being um, uh, given back to essentially the flag lot parcel so that it maintains its, its current state of non-conforming width. And that's all it is, just a transfer of these little tiny bits of land. And so therefore it's not a subdivision creating new frontage for any new parcel. So that's why it's approval not required. So all I need is a, this would just be an endorsement. So it would be my signature endorsing that you voted that this is not a subdivision. I move that we endorse the thing that does I not need our that. approval. <laughs> <laughs> The A and R on Kennedy Road. Okay. All right. A motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the planning board? Well, you know we have to do it. So. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yep. It's just very interesting language that uh, by doing the swap, it still stays non-conforming. Um, I find that usually a swap is, is trying to put something kind of together in a more appropriate way, but okay. That was my discussion. Well, hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Um, what would you start with uh, Marissa? Oh yes, because I have to. Endorsement, Melissa. Yes. All right, and Sam? Yes. Ms. Taylor, and how about Chris? Yes. David? Yes. And George says yes. And Krista, did I ask you? You didn't, but I say yes. Okay. Welcome back to the club. <laughs> because she has to. 
because I have to. <laughs> Welcome back. All right. To be clear, this is just lawyer humor. It's just, you know, it's a thing. I can't help it. Ooh, that sounds expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the only other thing is really, I don't have minutes for you. Um, there's going to be another joint public hearing for another zoning amendment <laughs> um, yeah. with legislative matters committee. Um, again, the way it worked out was um, uh, for them, hopefully you're, you're okay with this, is to go to their meeting on May 10th. Um, that's a Monday. Um, and at same times that they, I guess, would be more convenient for you all, which is seven o'clock. Um, and then we do have a meeting, a permit meeting on the 13th, which is stacking up to be a meeting with several permits anyway. So it's kind of better that we're separating out the zoning discussion from the permits um, discussion, because I think that would be an extra long meeting otherwise. Um, so I just wanted to give you the heads up and hopefully um, there'll be enough who are available May 10th to come to that joint um, public meeting, but I'll send out a notice um, to you all so you can put it on your calendars. And we still have a meeting two weeks from now on the 22nd with some applications? No, I'm canceling that meeting because it's school vacation week and that's sometimes difficult for people. Um, so no meeting on the 22nd and then two meetings that second week of May. Okay. And I'll, I'll just put in a plug for another meeting if you folks have any time next Wednesday Right. The Main Street redesign is going to have a public hearing again for input. Um, and the consultants will be showing some revised plans and um, having kind of a process to try to get input. So it's a pretty big deal for downtown Northampton. So if you folks are uh, have some time and you want to come into part of it, please do. That starts, I believe, at six o'clock on Wednesday. Uh I have a question um, as I enter my like fourth or fifth, I can't remember, hour of Zoom. Uh, I had at 5.30 today, I was on the PVPC uh, thing on Zoom Great. as the Northampton representative. Am I, am I supposed to do something? Like I went to the meeting, they said a bunch of stuff. Like, am I supposed to do something now or? I mean, I don't you know. can report back if there were any relevant conversations <laughs> that you think are, um, make sense. Um, you can do it now. You can do it at a, any time um, you feel. If you're Zoomed out now, you don't have to feel like you <laughs> need to do it now. <laughs> There's a, there was a fair amount of interesting stuff. I don't feel, um, uh, I don't have enough information to really speak intelligently about it. And maybe I think it's probably stuff that Carolyn knows way better than I do. Um, but there was a big um, housing bill just passed in January um, that has to do with how uh, legislation works in towns and cities. Uh, I don't know if it affects us that much. I'm sure Carolyn could tell us. So maybe at some further date, we should get into that. And it sounds yeah. like there's gonna be a round table for your type of people, planners and stuff uh, at the PVPC <laughs> at some point to get into that. And uh, I think yeah. that was the most relevant stuff. There was a bunch of stuff about transportation too, which I don't think we need to get into. Yeah, okay. I also, okay. I, I know Carolyn and I were, we were emailing a little bit about this church thing. And I don't know what the right time is or if that is gonna come to us or not, but um, I, 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 I understand what you, what you said and there financial constraints and all that kind of stuff with this tearing down this church but that was fully part of their plan like that that image of that church was 100 percent in the backdrop of what they were when they got that that thing okayed by us i asked i actually asked a question about tearing down that church and the cost of it and they pretty much in my mind said they weren't going to do it and I understand COVID ha happened, but I also understand the church isn't paying any money on, on this building and the notion that somehow they suddenly now deserve to make a profit on this thing, I find to be absurd. This is it. Like, 
they that was part of their part of their plan that they presented to us was the image of that church in the background of that building. But Sam, I, I just find it so disingenuous that I voted for something with that in the background, and now I'm getting turned around when when everyone knew the cost of it was massive. And it, I, I feel I'm just I feel so lied to by these developers in this process. I don't. You know, think it's not my job to make them money. And my name, my name has been was connected to something, and it is gross that I have okayed it. Sam, I don't think their application, I, I, I hear you, I feel your pain, buddy, but I don't think their application came before us with any stipulation that they would save the church. It may have been reflected. No, no, we actually, we, we, did talk, we did talk about the church. Yep. And we did, and more importantly, when we, when we asked for the pictures and all that kind of stuff, that church was in it as background. And if that was that's different than being like, oh, I'm gonna change a tree or this, that, and the other. That church was fully in that picture. So uh, I don't. I think that um, I understand. There's probably some interest in talking about this. I think, however, it's likely I mean, it that a project. Right. Well, I was just gonna say this is likely gonna come back as a project in front of the planning board. And so I don't want to go down the path of talking about something that could potentially be in front of the board um, and outside of the public hearing context and the requirement for um, open meeting, meeting open meeting law. Um, yeah. But um, so I think um, individually, if people have questions, they can certainly um, ask I, I will just um, clarify that the any project that any board member is you know votes to approve um, is for that particular project in you know that you're looking at this one in particular the applicant stated that they were going to make best efforts to save the church but that they wanted to move ahead with this phase of it which was the 23 townhouse units, but um, I um, don't think that, you know, any board members names associated with the permit that maybe has changed um, necessarily puts the board um, sort of needs to put the board on the defensive for approving a permit because you were approving what was in front of you at the time. So um, I'll leave it at that because I don't, I'm a little concerned about diving in too deeply about, about the permit um, condition. In, in the general sense, um, are planning boards allowed to um, attach historic preservation restrictions to approvals? Um, no, not if the project doesn't include in particular, um, if th there is one instance in, this, in Northampton where um, the board, it has the jurisdiction to grant a permit for the reuse of an historic property. And in that case, you there is a stipulation that historic preservation restriction um, is placed on the structure, but um, not on an adjoining structure or an abutting parcel, even if it's owned by the same property owner. Sam, be coffee with you and outside you know just one-on-one -on -one is joe and john citizen all right to talk through this yeah yeah i i have a problem with that i i guess i don't remember i um maybe you could find this out for me Kellen. is it, what what were the i would like to find the minutes for that for that because i actually remember <laughs> talking to them about that issue and I, i'd just like to review it to make sure what i what i said and what i didn't say i mean i understand it's not like verbatim yeah actually if you could follow up and actually just put in an email like the just the framework because just because it was in the paper and people have talked to me about it i know nothing about this thing at all and just if you could just like here's what happened a couple whatever it was and here's what was approved and just so i have the fear of 
bones of what happened? Well, I think what I would do is submit minutes, but also send you the link to the project files because right. in the application, I think they also describe sort of what the goal and what their um, desires would be, but that it would that it would be based on particular market conditions and um, options that they would be able to pursue or not pursue. So I think that. Um, but yes, I can send that to everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and, and Carolyn, just to follow up on David's uh, comment about the PVPC, maybe once a month, we could just put in the agenda like we do with the ANRs or the minutes, just a report back from committee involvement. So whether okay. anybody has something to say, I know we need to find somebody for the Community Preservation Committee, and there are some interesting things that come out of that. I believe Marissa is our rep to the CIP, which is over for this year, but at another time, it might be a helpful thing to hear back from that. So, yeah. Yeah. And I did just on that can note. I, um, I ask, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, okay, I would just ask that if we do that, um, that anybody like a day or two before um, who thinks who uh, they're going to have anything, let Carolyn know so that, because uh, that's how meetings get real long is that people are like, oh yeah, I did that thing. And now I'm going to talk about it. And I didn't pre prepare what I was going to say about it. And people, you know, it's just a way of kind of right. keeping a meeting in hand. Right. So just to be quick and wrap up to get to the hockey game. Um, Jana did say she went to um, the last CPC meeting and she is interested in serving as the board's representative. Um, once they, so, and that's all I have. All right. All right. <laughs> is there another motion to be made tonight? Oh, I move that we adjourn. Second. Motion made by Marissa, seconded by David. Any discussion? No. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, all those in favor, David? Yep. And Chris? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Marissa? Yep. And Sam? I do. But, and just, you know, I'm, I don't mean to be aggressively mad at it. I mean, I'm going to be okay if the church comes down. I'm going to survive.